So, extreme range RFID. A um, couple of points on uh, privacy and safety first. Um, there is only one type of RFID tag that I'm reading during this demonstration. That's the tags that I handed out. Um, it is a, a, a commercially available tag. There's, there's lots of others in circulation. So if at any point you're concerned about um, my equipment reading other tags that you don't want to be read, sit on them. Take it out of your pocket and stick it under your butt. Um, your, your backside will actually shield it quite, quite effectively. Um, so, yeah, don't, don't worry about that. Or, <laughs> it's, it's not a problem. I'm not going to be able to read through. I'm not using much power here. Um, secondly, during the demos, um, there is going to be you know, RF power coming out of this. Not a tremendous amount. Um, it's about a watt, in fact. Um, according to this meter, so it's, it's less power than a cell phone, but please don't touch the antennas if you, if you do walk up. Okay, so what is the, the, the RFID technology that I'm using here? It's called EPC Generation 2. Electronic Product Code is the, uh, the acronym. You can compare that to a universal product code, that's a barcode. Um, it's, the, the tags are effectively um, electronic barcodes. Um, or RFID barcodes, rather. Um, they're passively powered. They're UHF RFID. Um, they work at 900 megahertz. Um, if you look at the, the, the pieces of paper that were handed out when you came in, you should see a, a metal strip in it. That's the antenna for the tag. And if you look somewhere in the middle of that strip, there should be a little tiny dot, a little raised bump in the middle. That's the RFID chip itself. So um, it has a 96-bit uh, ID number. You can get them in different sizes from 64-bit up to 128-bit. Um, there is no security on these tags whatsoever, at least not anything that really means anything. Um, they do support uh, two special codes called a lock code and a kill code. If you set the lock code, you can then not change the tag number until you unlock it with the code again. Um, likewise, if you set the kill code, um, the next time you send that kill code, the tag will actually self-destruct. It'll turn itself off and disable itself. Unfortunately, both of these codes are sent in plain text by the reader to the tag. So with a, a Gen 2 sniffer, you can just pull the codes off the air and there's, there's no encryption. Um, similarly, there's no access control. There are a couple of proprietary versions of uh, Gen 2 that are extending the, the, the basic standard. Um, they, they support some kind of access control, but again, it's all done in plain text. There is, there is no encryption here whatsoever. Um, where are these tags used? Well, if you've got a passport card, not the book, but the, the little card that's good for travel in North America, um, you've got one of those in there. Um, if you've got a, an electronic driver's license or an enhanced driver's license that's currently an issue by New York and, and various other states, you've got a Gen 2 tag in there. Um, if you've ever bought a, a, a product at Walmart and got an RFID tag on a, on a label or something like that, again, that's EPC Gen 2. It's, it's very widely used, it's very widely deployed, um, largely because of its, its long-range nature. So what is it about EPC Gen 2 that makes it long-range? Well, if you look at a traditional RFID system, it's an inductive coupling. You have a coil of wire in the reader, you have a coil of wire in the tag, you bring the two close together and a magnetic field couples the two together. The reader can then send data to the tag by modulating the strength of that field. The tag can return data to the reader by consuming more or less power from that field. So all the data exchange happens by modulating uh, that magnetic field, as I said. The thing about magnetic fields is that um, the field strength drops off as the inverse cube of the distance. So unlike radio, where uh, the, available, um, the available energy is the inverse square of the distance, when you're talking about a, a magnetic system, you're talking about an inverse cube law. So power drops off very, very sharply. Um, you get a few inches away from the reader, and you've, you've typically got not enough power for the tag. Um, there's, there's some pretty fundamental limits involved there. Um, the, the, the maximum theoretical read range for a 13.56 megahertz tag is, I believe, about 35 feet. Um, hard limit of 35 feet. You cannot possibly read before, read further than that, no matter how much power you dump into it. Gen 2, on the other hand, um, these things are effectively radar IFF transponders. So what happens is um, the, 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 the radio waves that are coming in 
Some of those get absorbed by the tag and are used to, to power the tag. Others of them get reflected back from the tag. And the tag can actually control how much of that incident power gets reflected. So you can think of it like a, a, a radar system. If, a, if, if you imagine this, this setup here is a, a radar tower, and uh, you guys holding the tags, that's the, imagine the tag is an airplane. Um, you can imagine that as the plane tips its wings back and forth and exposes more or less surface area um, to the incident radiation, um, the, the, the return signal will get stronger or weaker. That's effectively what these tags are doing electronically. So it's modulating its coefficient of reflectivity. That's the, the, the catchphrase. Um, Gen 2 is actually a proper backscatter system. A lot of people say that, that RFID systems are all backscattering, but they're not. Uh, most of them are inductive coupling. This is the only one that I know of that is actually a backscatter system, in that I send the power and, and the tags scatter some of that power back towards me. Um, because it's a radar system, it's a radio system, and because it's radio, that means we've got an inverse square law with distance. Um, we're using an electromagnetic wave here. We've got a proper radio transmission rather than a magnetic field and, a, and an inductive coupling. So we can use proper radar techniques and proper radio techniques to increase our read range. It's, it's, it's otherwise a, a, a fairly typical radio system. It's, there's, there's a few differences uh, from, from most average radio systems, but it's, it's, it's close enough to a first approximation. So given that we've got a radar system, um, we can essentially come back to the radar range equation to predict our read range. Now the radar range equation has lots and lots and lots of different forms. Um, there's lots of ways of, of substituting out different parameters and you know, generating a, a range equation that, that contains just the parameters you need. Um, this particular form that's on the screen now, this is the, uh, the, the form of the radar range equation that I like. And this actually came from a company called Thing Magic, who, who manufacture Gen 2 RFID readers. And this is the equation that, that, that they use to, uh, to model uh, Gen 2 read range. So I'm not going to explain this, this in detail. I mean, uh, if, if you know any radio, this, this probably makes sense already. Um, all I'm going to say about it for, for the purposes of this talk is that um, we can see that the maximum range is derived from three things. Firstly, we've got uh, GR and GT. That's the gain of the receive antenna and the gain of the transmit antenna. So the maximum range is derived from the square root of the antenna gain. So if we put 100 times better antenna on it, we'd expect to see 10 times the read range. Likewise, transmit power, uh, PR and PT, that's the, 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 the transmit power and the, the incident power that's returned back from the tag. Um, if we up our transmit power by a factor of 100. Again, we'd expect to see the square root of that in a range increase, so we'd expect to see a factor of 10 increase. Um, beyond that, there's a bunch of stuff that we can't control. Um, lambda is our wavelength. We're, we're obviously you know, set to a specific frequency here, so our wavelength is dictated by that. Um, there's, there's a few other things that we can't control, but the, the, the important point that, that we can make from the radar range equation is that our, our read range is fundamentally proportional to the square root of antenna gain and the square root of transmitter power. So given this, um, we, we can take an off-the-shelf system and uh, we can scale it up. We're, we're talking about you know, making differences to a system. So we can treat you know, an off-the-shelf system as a reference system, and then we can work in, in ratios compared to that reference system. Now, the easiest way to do that is with decibels. Um, raise your hand if you're familiar with how decibels work. Okay, most of you. Um, so it's a logarithmic scale. It's, it's 10 times the, the, the base 10 logarithm of the ratio between two numbers. Um, the reason why logarithms are, are so useful when you're talking about radio is because uh, you can quantify a receive chain or a transmit chain. Each component in that has a certain number of decibels gain or loss. If you were to look at that as an absolute gain value, let's say that my, my power amp has a, a gain of 1,000, um, my attenuator might have a gain of 0.3, and my USRP might have an internal gain of, of 27.5. If we're working in linear numbers, we have to multiply those figures together in order to figure out what our overall power is. If we're working in decibels, however, we can say, just add them together. If you add decibels together, that's equivalent 
to multiplying the underlying numbers together. So it's convenient for, for you know, working the mathematics involved here. Decibels are just ratios. It's, it's a ratio between one number and another. So it's, it's useful on its own for expressing amplifier gain, um, but not tremendously useful for many other things. So what we can do is we can define one of those points. If we, if we say we've got decibels compared to a reference level, um, then we get things like dBm. So if we, have a, if we take a reference level of, of one milliwatt of RF power, and we express our transmit power in terms of decibels reference to one milliwatt, then we get a unit called dBm. Very convenient. Likewise, you can see I've got you know, two very large Yagis here, or reasonably large Yagis. What these do is they concentrate the, air, the, the, the radio energy into a, a narrow beam. It's about 15 degrees wide. So instead of radiating equally in all directions, an isotropic antenna um, radiates equally in all directions. We have directional gain because we're focusing that energy into one specific angle. So we have gain reference to an isotropic antenna, which is where dBi comes from. So what we can do is we can actually add all of these three different units together. They're, they're not actually really different units because if I've got, let's say I've got 10 dBm coming out of my USRP, I then put it into an amplifier with 100 dB gain, and then I put it into an antenna with 20 dBi gain, I can, I can just add those numbers together to figure out what my transmit power is. It's 10 plus 100 plus 10, or you know, whatever numbers I, I just said. Um, and you just add those together and, and you've got, at the end of it, you've got a measurement called the EIRP, the Effective Isotropic Radiated Power. Um, not a particularly meaningful measurement, but it, it is a, a valid measurement nonetheless. And, and it is perfectly valid to add dBm, dBi, and, and dB gain um, to, to, to just make life simpler. So I mentioned that these tags work in the, the, the 900 megahertz band. Um, more precisely, that's the 902 to 928 megahertz ISM band. The tags actually support a, a wider frequency range than that. They'll actually go down to about 850 megahertz because not all countries around the world use the same frequencies for, for Gen 2. So uh, they, they, they're pretty wide band. Um, they're very low power, obviously. Um, and because of the, uh, the, the, the ISM rules, the industrial scientific medical rules that govern how you have to operate in this band, um, they're, they're very low power. The, the, the reader is very low power. It's limited to a maximum of one watt. Um, it's very low utilization, so it has a low duty cycle. The, the transmitter is only transmitting for a very short proportion of, of any given second. It also hops frequency very regularly. Again, this is a, an ISM regulation. The ISM uses of the, the, the 902 to 928 megahertz band, they're actually secondary though. Um, it's primarily a ham radio band, but ham radio operators tend not to like it because of all of the ISM applications. There's so many ISM transmitters in the band that it raises the noise threshold and uh, from, from most hams that, that makes it just completely unworkable because there's just too much noise. So if we approach the band as an, as an ISM band, then we've got very strict rules on power, on antenna gain, on frequency hopping, all of this kind of stuff. If we approach it as a ham radio band, we've got much less restrictions. So what do we actually get from approaching this as a ham radio band? Well, first off, we need a license. Um, they're, they're pretty easy to get. Ham radio licenses, the, the, the questions are all published. Um, it's, it's effectively you know, open source examinations. Um, the, the URL that's on the screen now is a, a, a Parrot-style learning um, application. Um, you, they, they present questions in order, and if you get the question right, they never show it to you again. If you get the question wrong, they'll show it to you again, and they'll keep showing it to you until you get it right. Um, you can spend a few hours on this site and just you know, commit to memory, just you know, really uh, uh, cram that, that information in there, walk into the test the next day, and just pass it. Um, I would actually recommend, though, that uh, you, you take the time to understand. If you come across a question that you don't understand the answers to, look it up on Wikipedia. Um, you know, find out what's going on there. You'll learn a lot out of it. So generally, um, amateur radio operators have a, a 1,500 watt hard limit on power. Um, in this particular band, though, we're, we're limited to 50 watts if we're within 241 kilometers of White Sands missile testing range. Um, I have no idea what they're doing with the ISM band at White Sands, but they, they don't want ham radio operators screwing it up. Um, in terms of, of what kinds of modulation you're allowed to say, you're allowed to transmit, 
Well, this is a digital system. It's, it's sending bits back and forth. And in ham radio terms, it's technically there's, uh, well, there's a list of allowed transmission types and a list of allowed digital codes. But in general, you're allowed to transmit any unspecified digital code that's, that's not explicitly called out in the, the, the list of permitted um, schemes as long as the specification is published. So in this case, the EPC Generation 2 spent standard is published, so we're perfectly fine using it on a ham radio band. Um, the only problem with it is that we're not allowed crypto. Well, the tags don't actually support any crypto. You're not allowed to you know, obscure the meaning of the message anyway in, in ham radio terms, but these tags aren't capable of that, so it's, it's no big deal. Um, there's also no limits on antenna gain. Um, in the ISM band, if you're using it as an ISM band, you're limited to 6 dBi of antenna gain. Well, as a ham band, there's, there's no such limits. These antennas have 13 dBi of gain. Um, you could quite easily get antennas with significantly more than that. So, the commercial Gen 2 reader. Um, I have one here. This thing. So this is a, a symbol XR400. Um, this was $250 on eBay. Um, as I mentioned, uh, it's, it's compliant with the ISM rules, so it's, it's very rapidly frequency hops, uh, about 100 times a second. Now, what that means is if, we, if we're trying to port that to a ham radio application, um, the one thing that we can't do with that is figure out what frequency it's on and then identify the transmitting station. That's one of the big key things that you have to do as a ham radio operator. You have to identify your station. And if we're frequency hopping 100 times a second, that's, that's virtually impossible. Um, you could theoretically do it with a, a very, very fast spectrum analyzer and some very clever software, but it's, it's really quite prohibitively difficult. Um, this reader, because it's ISM, it's limited to one watt of output power. It's limited to 6 dBi of antenna gain. And it actually checks for a correct antenna. Um, if you just try and connect this thing to any old antenna, it'll just turn off the, the, the read port. Um, you can see I've got, there's eight RF sockets on here. That's actually four receive ports and four transmit ports. So I can connect four pairs of antennas to this. And, and if they're legitimate antennas, it'll turn the port on and start dumping power out of them. If it doesn't detect a legitimate antenna, it'll just disable the port. So how can we improve on this? How can we, we make this reader better? Well, the first thing to do is obviously replace the antennas. Um, it's really easy to get hold of, of you know, high-gain Yagi's. Uh, these were about 50 bucks each. Um, so we've got 13 dBi gain compared to the 6 dBi gain of the, the, the reference antenna. So overall, we've got 7 decibels of um, improvement in the antenna system. Now, if we go back to the radar range equation, we should see a range increase that corresponds to the square root of the antenna increase. So because we're working in decibels, we can actually take a square root by halving. So if we've got 7 dBi improvement in the antennas, we should expect to see 3.5 decibels of improvement in, um, in read range. As it works out, 3.5 decibels is a factor of 2.25. Um, and if we compare that to our reference of 30-foot read range, which is what this, this reader does out of the box, we would expect to see that these antennas should give us a read range of about 67.5 feet, assuming that the radar range equation is correct. First, though, we need to defeat the antenna protections. We need to find a way to get this reader to talk to these antennas. It's actually really easy to do. Um, the way that they've protected it is they put a 10 kilo ohm resistor between the active element of the antenna and ground. Um, and then they check the DC impedance of the, the antenna. If it's, if it's uh, just a normal antenna, there's going to be one of two DC impedances. Either it's just a you know, piece of wire sticking up in the air, that's, that's you know, an antenna, in which case that has infinite impedance. It's, it's open circuit at DC. Um, alternatively, if you've got an antenna like this, um, you can see these active elements right here. Um, this is a, a, a loop. So at DC, this is zero impedance. So how do we match the, uh, the, the zero impedance of our Yagi, or zero DC impedance of our Yagi, to the, the, the reader's expected 10K? Well, it's actually really easy to do. Um, you start off by soldering a 10K resistor inside the antenna port, uh, inside the reader between the, the, the read port and ground, so it sees that DC impedance. Um, and then the, only, uh, the, the next part is to, um, to, to convert the, the zero impedance of these things at DC 
to uh, open circuit effectively. And that's where one of these things comes in. This is just an ISM band filter. So all this does is um, it, whatever you put into it, it filters out um, anything that's not within the 902 to 928 megahertz ISM band, and that comes out. Um, fortunately, the, the, the input of this is a capacitor, meaning that at DC, it's open circuit. So if we stick one of these filters between the transmitter and the antenna, we've then got the 10K impedance inside the transmitter, we've got zero impedance, we've got uh, effectively open circuit at DC uh, from the antennas, and we're all good. So we did this, and we tested it, and we got a read range of 70 feet. So consistent with the radar range equation, and uh, you know, good, good first confirmation of the theory. So the next stage is power amplification. That's, that's the other big switch, that, the other big lever that we can throw to, um, to, to improve our read range here. Um, we could just put an amplifier on the output of this. I mean, we can, we can use the same techniques to defeat the antenna locks um, to make it think that it's talking to its own antenna when it's actually talking to a, a big beefy power amplifier. Um, that's, that's perfectly viable. The problem with it is that we're not compliant with ham radio rules. We, we, we need to identify the station. Um, secondly, another problem with it is that because it hops frequency so rapidly, it's virtually impossible to see that signal on a spectrum analyzer. So it's very difficult to measure it, it's very difficult to quantify it, um, and it, it just makes designing an RF chain that much harder. So overall, yeah, we could, you know, we, we could quite happily amplify the signal from the reader, but it's kind of inelegant, and it's, it's probably a, a pretty serious violation of FCC rules because you're not identifying the station, even though you're operating under ham radio rules. So a better Gen 2 reader, um, the link here is a, a, a reader for, for this little black box here. This is, I don't know if you can all see this. Uh, this is a USRP, the Universal Software Radio Peripheral. Um, this is a, a software radio device. So effectively, the computer does all the work of, of modulation and you know, the, the coding and figuring out how to actually put those bits on the radio. And then the USRP just takes that data stream over USB, upscales it to, to whatever baseband frequency you've got. Um, it's open source, um, and the, the, the big advantage that it gives us is frequency control. It's, it's, it sits on a specific frequency, just one frequency that's set in software, and we can control that. So instead of having to follow this frequency hopping system, we now have one frequency that we need to wor worry about. Um, the, the, this package also includes a Gen 2 sniffer. Um, it does need the USRP2, but if you, if you run this thing, um, you can actually sniff the kill and lock codes from any reader that you like. Um, it doesn't include the, the ability to re read the responses from the tag, just because those signals are so very much smaller. But certainly you can, you can sniff the kill code and the lock code um, as they're sent by the reader. Um, another little um, uh, tweak that I've made to the USRP, um, I've actually upgraded the, the clock in it. I do a lot of work with GSM, um, and GSM requires a 52 megahertz clock, whereas the SOC USRP and, and this RFID system needs the the standard 64 megahertz clock. So switching between those two, I, I don't know how many people use uh, USRPs and, and, and are interested in things like GSM. Um, there's a, a, an open source hardware project called the Clock Tamer. Um, extremely accurate clocking, very programmable, very controllable. Um, I highly recommend it to anyone who's, who's doing work with the USRP. So how do we identify the station? Now that we've got a, a, a fixed frequency, how do we identify? Well, all we have to do to, to identify the station in compliance with ham radio rules is transmit a, a, a call sign. We, we have to transmit a Morse code call sign just with a, a, an unmodulated carrier. So not, not tremendously difficult to do. We just need to find a way to generate that carrier. Now, we could, obviously, we're working with the USRP, so obviously we could use that to transmit our radio signal if we wanted. But to be honest, I couldn't be bothered. There was an easier way to do it. Um, that easier way would be a second transmitter. If you have a second transmitter on the same frequency, um, slightly higher power, um, and that second transmitter sends out your call sign, then any receivers that are tuned to that frequency, they'll hear the RFID signal, and then when that second transmitter kicks in, it'll overwrite the RFID signal, and you'll hear the call sign on top of it. So it'll effectively DOS the system for a second while it identifies, but it's just for a few seconds every 10 minutes or so, so it's, it's not really a major deal. So we need an easily scriptable 900 megahertz transmitter. 
Um, the easiest transmitter that I was able to find um, was one of these. Um, this is the, the IMME. Um, this is rapidly becoming a hardware hacker's favorite device. Um, they don't normally come with uh, SMA connectors and JTAG on the bottom. I, I, that's an aftermarket modification. Uh, but uh, Travis Goodspeed did a lot of work with these things because there's no firmware security. So if you go to Travis's blog, um, there's a tutorial for how to wire a JTAG connector into it, a source code for a new operating system, and as long as you've got a good FET to, to program the thing, you can just write your own operating system for it. Quite a powerful little device, little LCD screen, keypad, um, very, very wide frequency range, and, and about 10 dBm of output power. So pretty, pretty flexible, pretty powerful, um, and all we really need to do is, is you know, connect that to the USRP, mux those signals together, um, having matched the power levels together first. Because if we, if we look at the signal from the ID, from the, the IMME, that's coming out at about 10 dBm, 10 milliwatts. Um, the signal from the USRP is at about 500 milliwatts. So we need to, to match those levels. And the way that I, I do that is by somewhat attenuating the signal from the USRP, somewhat amplifying the signal from the IME, and then just mixing them together with a, a standard power splitter. So it's, it's not tremendously difficult to do. Um, a quick demo of the, the station identification. Let me just turn on my power chain here. So this is a, just a ham radio receiver. Um, it's actually, it does actually transmit as well, but um, at the moment I've got it receiving uh, 915 megahertz. So I'm right in the middle of that ISM band. And uh, if I turn the volume up here, so that clicking noise, that's the signal from the reader. That's the, the RFID interrogator pulses coming out, telling the tags to, to, to wake up and start doing stuff. And if I push a button on the IM me, You can hear, how many people copied that? Nobody copied that. Did you actually hear the signal? Okay, let me, let me do that again. So that's the RFID. So we've taken care of ident identification. So it's, it's really easy to do. Um, just match the frequencies together, uh, mix the signals, match the power levels, and, and we're in business. So we've now got a fully compliant ham radio transmitter. We're, we're identifying the station. We're operating with complete compliance with ham radio regulations. Um, we're now good to go with up to 1,500 watts of power. That's rather a lot. Um, at, at UHF, um, you're talking about line of sight communication. You don't get ionospheric reflection or anything like that. So typically, you're looking at you know, maybe a couple of watts being you know, a, a useful amount of power. Um, this transmitter here, um, this, this power amplifier, um, is considerably bigger than that. Um, this is rated at 70 watts. Now, when I say it's rated at 70 watts, 70 watts is the point at which the gain starts leveling off. So it'll actually deliver a lot more than 70 watts. It'll actually deliver about 100 watts which in RF terms is a huge amount of energy to be dumping into UHF. Um, it's actually not tremendously difficult to get, rid to get hold of even bigger amplifiers. This does 600 watts. Um, this was recovered from a, um, uh, an old analog uh, mobile phone station, which also just happens to operate in the same band. Um, so this is 600 watts of RF, and, and quite honestly, at, at UHF, that's a terrifying amount of power. It's, it's really quite scary. I mean, uh, you'll, you'll get RF burns off of this really easily when it's powered up. I actually didn't bring the power supply for that just specifically because it, it, it's too scary given the, the kind of crowd that comes to these events. So we'll, we'll stick with the 70 watt amplifier for this, for this demo. We're not, we're not even cranking it up anywhere near the maximum. Um, this was $400 um, online. And the thing about um, ham, uh, uh, RF amplifiers is they don't tend to have volume knobs. You can't just you know, tweak the volume up and down. What you have to do is limit the input power to it in order to control the output power. They have fixed gain. So we've got a maximum, you know, an upper limit on this power amplifier of 20 milliwatts power input. We've only got 10 milliwatts coming out of the IME, so we need to amplify that up slightly. 
Um, that, I don't know if you can see, there's a tiny little amplifier in this cable, little miniature thing with these power clips connected to it. Um, that amplifies it up to you know, plenty of power to drive the, uh, the power amplifier. And then the USRP, we attenuate the signal down to, to match that. Um, and, and we're all good. It's not tremendously difficult. It's all off-the-shelf parts, uh, mini circuits and down east microwave are you know, pretty common supplies for this kind of stuff. So we can increase our range. We can increase our power. Um, what, what can we use to, to, to try and quantify this? Well, we noticed a, a pretty interesting artifact on the read range in that um, there's, there's going to be one of two situations happening here. When we try and read a tag at long distance, there's going to be one of two things happening. Either, um, well, either it'll read or it won't. And if it doesn't read, then it's going to be because either this transmitter isn't supplying enough power for the tag to switch on, or alternatively, the signal that's coming back from the tag isn't enough to, to register in the, excuse me, on the receive side. So we need some way to differentiate the two so that we know if we need to up the transmit power or up the receive gain. And the way that we can do that is by looking for hysteresis on read range, because the tags require an initial burst of, of higher power to turn on. Once they've gotten that, that higher, higher um, startup current, they'll actually drop down in power consumption. So if you look at that in terms of, of the, the power available to the tag being directly related to the read range, you'll have to bring your tag closer to the antenna, at which point it'll switch on, and then you can take the tag further away from the antenna before it switches off. So if we see that hysteresis on, on read range, we know that we're limited by transmit power. Alternatively, if we're limited by receive gain, then we'll just see a single point where if we go too far, it turns off, and if we're too close, it turns on. So depending on whether or not we see that hysteresis on read range, we know whether we need to increase the transmit power or the receive gain in order to bump up read range. And in both cases, those, those follow the, the, the radar range equation. So what are the limits on range here? We've got you know, one and a half kilowatts that we can put out of the antenna, and, and we're restricted to you know, whatever antennas we can get hold of. So you know, really, the, the, the power output and the, the antennas aren't really our limits anymore. Um, the, the primary limit that we're going to come across is noise and interference. Um, there's a lot of different sources of noise um, in the ISM band. Um, obviously, other ISM stations, other transmitters on the same frequency. Um, receiver sensitivity, there's going to come to a point where the signal is just plain too weak to be picked up. Um, and you know, the most sensitive amplifier that money can buy still won't be sensitive enough to pick up that signal. That's going to be a limit eventually. There's also going to be crosstalk between the transmit and the receive side. We have got two separate antennas because we actually do full duplex communication on a single channel. So obviously, you know, we're transmitting a carrier out to the tag, and the tag is modulating that carrier back to us. So there's, there's no way that we can stop energy from the, the, the transmitter coming directly back into the reader. We just we can't do it because it's on the same frequency. Clutter is another source of interference, and this is a big one. Um, this is where um, there'll be reflections from other non-metallic, uh, from other metallic items um, that are, you know, reflecting power. We've got a radar system here, so anything that's metal is going to be reflecting our radio energy back at us exactly the same way that any radar system does. So any metal objects in the in the vicinity, um, I suspect the backs of the chairs are going to be a problem. The probably the back wall of the room. Um, there's going to be all kinds of, of spurious signals coming back at us here. And eventually, um, those signals are going to swamp the real signal from the tag, and we just won't be able to read it. Um, ground interference. Well, we've got our Yagis pointed you know, pretty much horizontally out across the audience here, um, but they've got a 15-degree beam width. So there's a few degrees up and a few degrees down that that energy is still directed. So some of that will be reflected off the ground before it hits the tag, which will scramble the signal at the tag. Likewise, the reflection that comes back from the tag, some of that will be reflected off the ground again, and again, it'll confuse our reader. So we can improve things by you know, lifting it up off the ground. Um, the, antennas aren't just so, the, the antenna stands here aren't just so that we can you know, see over your heads. Um, it's, it's also to reduce this ground interference. Atmospheric effects, well, the radar range equation is great, but it's, it's only valid in a, in a vacuum with no other transmitters and no noise and a perfect receiver and a perfect transmitter and all kinds of other things. 
Um, in the real world, the, the, the air gets in the way of these transmissions to some degree and attenuates it somewhat beyond what the radar range equation predicts. And then eventually, when we get to really extreme ranges, um, we're, we're working with UHF, which does not reflect off the ionosphere. So we're restricted to line of sight. And eventually, just the curvature of the Earth is going to get in our way. Hopefully, if we can get that kind of range out of it. So if we put all of these parts together, we've got one watt of RF power coming out of the commercial reader. And we've increased that to 70 watts with our power amplifier. That's an 18 dB gain in power. So from the radar range equation, we would expect to see the square root of that in range gain. So we'd expect to see 9 decibels increase in range. Um, from the antennas, well, the commercial reader started out with 6 dBi, and we went to 13 dBi. So we've got 7 decibels gain increase in the antenna system, which means we should see a 3.5 decibel increase in range. So comparing that all together um, with our 30-foot reference range, we should see an overall range gain of 12.5 decibels over our, our 30 foot read range. So we would expect to see 565 feet if we're running this transmitter at full power. What did we actually get? 217 feet. Not the 500 we were hoping for, but 217 feet. That's a long way to read an RFID tag from. Um, you can see in this picture here, um, there's all of my equipment in the foreground. You can see the, the, these Yagis bolted to the, 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 the top of the car just on the far side. And then you can see my wife in the, in the background holding an RFID tag up. That was reading successfully at that distance. Um, that picture wasn't actually the, the final read range. That picture was at about 180 feet. Um, we didn't get a picture of the final range because we were kicked out by Google Campus security. Um, apparently, they don't like big, powerful radio transmitters in their abandoned lots. I can't imagine why. So why so little? Why do we only get 217 feet rather than the 565 that we were expecting? Well, first off, 217 feet, as far as I'm aware, that's still a world record. Um, the, the only two other instances that I've been able to find of, of people reading passively powered RFID at, at long range, um, Flexalist did a demo in uh, 2008 at Black Hat where they, they uh, demonstrated 70 feet of read range, or 69. Um, and then there was a talk that a, a chap called Ravi Papu from uh, Thing Magic gave uh, at, at Google, where he claimed um, 213 feet, I believe it was. So just scraped by with a, a record on there. Um, but the thing of it is, that was with three watts of RF power, at least three watts as indicated by my little meter here. In reality, it was a little more than that because um, the, the transmission is pulsed. And this meter reads average power. So it's actually, if you, if you calculate it out and, and kind of work out how much power is coming out and how much I'm attenuating it and all the various losses in the chain and the gain of all the different amplifiers, it's, I calculate it out at about 10 watts. So the thing of it is, we did obviously have the capability to, to significantly increase power beyond 10 watts. Um, but we actually found that increasing power decreased the read range. And the likely reason that we've, we found for that, if you look in the, the, the top left corner of this picture, um, this is actually uh, an abandoned lot uh, beside the Google campus. And the, uh, the, the tent that you can see in the background is Shoreline Amphitheater. You can see there's a big chain link fence that runs around Shoreline Amphitheater. That was a source of clutter. And as it turned out, there was so much energy being reflected from that chain link fence that it was swamping the signal from the tag. And putting in more power increased the amount of clutter, decreased the read range, because it decreased the, uh, the signal to noise ratio from the tag. So nonetheless, we're still consistent with the radar range equation. 10 watts, 217 feet, 13 dBi of antenna gain. That still matches the radar range equation. But it, there's, there's no way that this equipment is limited to 217 feet. It's, it's absolutely possible of significantly more than that. And if, if someone is able to, to find me a suitable test range, I'm, I'm willing to demonstrate it. Obviously, I've got all the equipment here. Um, I believe that this equipment will read at 1,000 feet. And um, I think probably the, the, the best way to demonstrate that is uh, if it's possible to get access to a roof in, in Vegas. Um, because then you can shoot the antenna down at 45 degrees, and any reflections go out away from you and, and don't cause clutter. So I'm, I'm perfectly willing to, to, to set this all up and, and try it for a 1,000-foot read. 
Um, certainly 217 feet is, is what I've demonstrated so far. So quick demo of, of long range tag reading then. Let's see if this works. Um, so for some reason, um, my, my machine here that I'm using, um, the, it doesn't want to talk to the projector, so I'll, I'll have to show you on the screen here. It's, it's, it's pretty easy to understand though. So, I don't know how many people, can you, can you at least see something on the screen here? Um, the idea is, if you see white text, um, that's a, uh, a signal from the tag. It's, it's some kind of something. It's, it's interacting with the tag in some manner. If you see red text scrolling past, it successfully managed to read a tag, but the, 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 the ID number that it got back failed the checksum. So it's a successful read, but failed the checksum. And then you'll see, uh, I think it's blue uh, that scrolls past um, to, to, to show a successful tag read. So what I want to do is, um, I'll, I'll start the software up here, I'll turn the power amp on. Okay, so you can see white text scrolling past. That means it's, it's doing something. So what I want everyone to do is um, notice that the, the antennas, um, the, the, the elements go vertically. Now, what that means is that the, the energy that comes out of this is vertically polarized. So the, 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 the orientation of the antenna has to match the orientation of the tag. So if you look at your tags, um, you'll see the, 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 the thin metal stripe goes sideways across the tag. You want to hold it so that that stripe is vertical. Okay? And in theory, if you hold up tags, you should see... So bad reads coming through. There's all kinds of stuff scrolling past. Um, and if the, the first, maybe first five rows can put their tags down and we'll, you know, everyone else behind there keep your tags up. Oh, software has just stopped. Let me start that again. Okay. So you can see there's still bad reads coming by. There's still, still data coming by. It's still interacting with the tags at these distances. Um, and I, as I suspected, though, there is far too much clutter from the, the, the seats and from the, the, the back wall here. So um, it's, you can see that clearly there's you know, a good read range here. We're getting well into the you know, fifth, sixth row, tenth row, something like that. Um, and we've, we've actually got pretty decent read range here. So let's, let's talk for a moment about the upper limits on this. Um, we've demonstrated that um, uh, Gen 2 read range is controlled by the radar range equation. So let's, let's look at this logically and see, well, how far can we take this? Well, ham radio rules are, are the ultimate rules that we're working under. So we're limited to 1,500 watts of transmit power on whatever antenna we can get hold of. Um, this picture here is a, a two by two loop Yagi array. Um, each one of these Yagis is 26 feet long. And you can buy this array for about $1,000. It gives you about 26 decibels of gain over isotropic. Um, if you actually crunch the numbers on that with a legal limit 1500 watt ham transmitter, that gives you a read range of about two miles. Um, kind of scary. Next stage up from that though is, is a little worse. If we look at what the military can do, um, there's a, a, a Navy system called ANSPS-49. Um, this is a, a naval radar system that runs in the, you know, very similar frequency band. It's certainly capable of operating in the, the, the right band. Um, that supplies 280 kilowatts of power into a dish that's 24 feet wide by 14 feet tall. That gives us about 35 decibels of gain over isotropic. And uh, if we crunch the numbers on that, we get a range of about 80 miles. So in theory, um, Assuming that the radar range equation continues to hold true, um, military uh, radar systems should be able to read Gen 2 tags from about 80 miles away. Um, there is a better one, though. Arecibo. Amateur radio operators do get to use Arecibo from time to time. Um, there was a, a recent um, exercise where uh, a, a bunch of hams got together, put a 400-watt transmitter on the Arecibo dish, and pointed it at the moon so that uh, ham radio operators all over the world were, were taking little tiny handheld Yagis, much smaller than this, pointing it at the moon, bouncing signals off the moon, and talking to Arecibo. Purely amateur operation. Um, it, it, it's rare, but it does happen that amateurs do get access to Arecibo. 
So if we, if we consider for a moment, we've got a thousand foot dish, that gives us 70 decibels of gain over isotropic. And again, the 1500 watt ham radio power limit, theoretical limit of read range for our SIBO is 317 miles. Let me put that into perspective. You could put an EPC Gen 2 tag on the International Space Station and read that tag from Arecibo as the ISS flies overhead. Assuming that the radar range equation continues to hold true, and we've, we've certainly seen plenty of evidence that it does. So the real world is, is never quite the same as, as theory. Um, 317 miles, in, in reality, that's probably not gonna happen. There's gonna be other effects come into play. There's gonna be other limitations. Um, but certainly, we, we have confirmed the theory. EPC Gen 2 tags, the read range is dictated by the radar range equation. We get the square root of the antenna gain as a range gain. We get the square root of the power gain as a range gain. So very significant ranges are definitely possible. Um, with this equipment, I've read tags successfully at 217 feet. Um, it's absolutely possible to do more with the equipment that I have. Um, I, I hit the limits of my test range rather than the, the, the limits of the equipment. Um, the primary limit of my equipment at the moment is the, 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 the receiver. It's not very discriminating in that it can't tell the difference very well between a tag and clutter. Um, that's the, the, the main thing that screwed me up. And that's, that's actually possible to improve on um, because it's, it's all DSP. It's, it's fairly difficult to do. Um, eventually, you're going to hit a limit on round trip time. EPC Gen 2 is very sensitive to timing. So um, eventually, just the, the time it takes for your signal to get from the, the antenna to the tag and back again, it's, it's going to time out um, before you can, uh, you can actually read anything. So I, I had a, a bunch of scenarios here. And I'm, I'm actually running out of time. I'm, I'm just going to cover my, my top three. You can uh, see the... The, the white paper in the, um, in the, the oh, it's on the CD that explains all of these in detail. Uh, I'm just gonna skip through to, to some of my favorites here. Um, things that you can do with uh, EPC Gen 2 tags. Um, my top three, um, ultimate stag prank. Um, I bought 1,500 tags for Black Hat and DEF CON for a total of 100 bucks. I could quite happily reprogram those to look like passport cards and then drop them in someone's trunk as they try and cross a border. I have no idea what Customs and Border Protection are going to do when they see 1,500 passports in your trunk, but I'm willing to bet it won't be pleasant. Please don't try this. Or if you do, take lots of pictures. Um, another uh, thing that EPC Gen 2 is used for, uh, it's widely used at the pallet level for, for stock control, um, but companies like Walmart uh, are increasingly use it to tag individual product SKUs. So what that means is you'll have a unique tag code for every size, every color, every style, every item in the store, everything. Now, given that you can just walk around Walmart and read what these tags are, there's no access control, you can then read these tags at very long range and identify the style, size, color, type of clothes that someone's wearing from a mile away. I, I don't really want to think about what stalkers would do with that information. It, it gets very, very creepy very quickly if you can tell what kind of underwear someone is wearing from a mile away. Um, that, that's just disturbing. Uh, they're supposed to be, but you can actually kill the killers. Um, not least because you can, um, uh, you can reprogram the tags. You can sniff the kill code and then just walk around the store and change the kill code on all the tags. Um, my, my number one um, way to abuse this, though, is mall surveillance. And, and the reason this got my number one slot is because I think it's actually a viable business model. Um, what you could do is install uh, multiple long-range readers, or sorry, multiple RFID readers, um, short-range readers, at the entrance to a mall, such that when you walk through the door, it's a very narrow kind of choke point, and uh, you, you, you're within range of, of every tag uh, at the same time. So you can read everything that they've got on them. You can read their credit cards, you can get their name, you can get their passport information if they've got it. And more importantly, you can get the ID number of any Gen 2 tags that they have. Correlate that all together in a database and then use that long range tag to track that individual as they walk around a mall. Clearly we've got you know, hundreds of feet of read range, so you won't need many read points to cover a, a typical mall. And then you get lots of really, really granular info about you know, what route did you take around the mall? What stores did you look in? What, what windows did you pause by? To, you know, did, you, did you slow down when you walked past the pet store because you were looking at the, the, the kittens in the window? 
it's all kinds of, of really, really deep data that, uh, you know, folks like mole owners, they can really use that. They can really mine this data to, you know, really plan strategies around marketing and, and all kinds of things. Um, obviously, there's all kinds of info that you can get from cooperating stores. You can, you know, tap into their loyalty programs and get names and addresses, all kinds of stuff. It's, it's, it's potentially a real problem. One quick word about defenses, and, and just a quick word because it's, it's kind of standard fare for this stuff. There's two solutions to all of this RFID problems. Um, solution number one, don't put RFID in identity documents. Here's the thing about these tags that I handed out or, or that were handed out uh, when you walked in. You guys have no idea what those tags are. Um, they all have unique serial numbers. Um, if you actually read the tag number, there's a little uh, URL embedded in the tag number as well. Um, but they're all unique serial numbers. You don't know whether the people that were handing those tags out were supposed to give unique special serial numbers to special people. So Mr. Joe Grand here might have gotten, you know, a specific tag number so that I know that Joe's tag is, is whatever number it is and I can track Joe specifically. You don't know if I was doing that. You don't know if I was taking pictures as, as tags were handed out so that I can correlate ID numbers against faces. You don't know. But you also don't know with your driver's license and the difference between the tags that I gave out and the tag in your driver's license is that you can throw mine away. That's the big point here. Um, if you put RFID in identity documents, you cannot get rid of it legally. Because if you disable that tag, you're tampering with an ID. You're tampering with an ID, and you're probably going to fall foul of the law somewhere. So first off, don't put RFID in identity. And secondly, disable store issue RFID tags upon purchase. Um, Yes, places are supposed to disable RFID tags. A lot of places claim that they do. But until there's a law in place that says that they have to, it's entirely discretionary. If they decide that they don't want to disable tags anymore, they don't have to. On a personal level, um, the best defense against RFID is a microwave. Um, three seconds in a microwave and any tag will blow up. Um, five seconds in a microwave and pretty much any tag will catch fire. So watch out you don't do it for too long. Um, and like I said, it's, it's possibly illegal if you do it to your ID. Um, I, I don't want to speculate what would happen if you fried the tag in your passport, for example, and then tried to cross a border with it. Uh, they might get a little bit upset with that. Okay, so any questions? Yes. So the question was, is there another way to disable tags uh, short of putting them in the microwave? Um, the simple answer is no. Um, unless you know the kill code for the Gen 2 tag, you cannot kill it. Um, most other tags don't actually support kill functionality. So unless you're, you're certain that you know what type of tag it is and, and you know, you're certain that you know the kill code, there's really nothing you can do and, and physically destroying it is about the only defense you can take. Yes? A little louder? Who sets the kill code? It's the, the, the end user. Um, so when the tags are supplied, they're supplied with no kill codes, no lock codes, and, and you program the, the, the codes as you program the ID numbers. Uh, no, there's no default. Yes? Uh, if you can be certain that you've actually smacked the chip, yes. If you smack the antenna, it'll do nothing. Uh, possibly. Possibly. Yes, one more question. Um, the, the time it takes to read a code, I can actually demonstrate that really easily. So each one of those, each one of those pulses is an entire conversation. So each tick is, uh, there's, there's about three commands in, in the standard uh, interrogation. Um, you can read hundreds of tags in milliseconds. It's very, very fast. Okay, one more question. No, I've, I've, the question is, do I have any waveforms from greater than 270 feet? No, I don't. Um, because the, the equipment that I've been using to test all of this is a spectrum analyzer. I don't actually have an oscilloscope that goes up that, that fast. Okay, thanks very much.